subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect hello you all i am your host usma jafri with another episode of south asia focus Let's begin the show with the India Nepal bilateral ties that have received a fresh impetus following acceleration in the talks and visit of a high level dignitaries. The decades old camaraderie had hit a few roadblocks in past few months which experts had alleged foreign intervention. Recently Indian foreign secretary Harsh Vardhan Shringla led a high level delegation visit to Kathmandu where the two sides reviewed entire gamut of bilateral ties and committed to further strengthen their ties politically. A high level diplomatic intervention into what was being referred to as an all time low in the bilateral ties of two countries has rejuvenated the decades old Indo Nepal camaraderie. The ties had earlier suffered a brief rough patch owing to what few observers have blamed on improper communication and a foreign intervention in the decision making corridors of Kathmandu. Indian Foreign Secretary Harsh Vardhan Shringla visited the Himalayan nation where both the countries reviewed various aspects of the bilateral ties between the two countries. While the two sides pledged to deepen cooperation, they also discussed the boundary matter which had become political flashpoint a few months back. They say they have worked out a plan. we had a very productive and useful uh, exchange uh, the very large number of issues uh, uh, of bilateral cooperation that we went through it shows the multifaceted and comprehensive nature of our cooperation uh, we both agreed on various steps to advance some of the areas of uh, cooperation uh, very good progress on the commitments made by leadership uh, looking at some other initiatives that could happen The Nepali side appreciated the Indian government's active facilitation in ensuring smooth and unhindered cross-border flow of trade and commerce and active implementation of development projects even during the pandemic. India is Nepal's largest trade partner, accounting for nearly 60% of the country's imports. The two sides have agreed to continue their renewed momentum in high-level bilateral engagements and to further strengthen the traditionally close, friendly and multifaceted partnership between the two countries. We are very close friends. There are a lot of opportunities and potentials to further strengthen and to elevate our relations in the near heights. I do believe that this visit will lay a solid foundation to further strengthen our relations. Prime Minister KP Sharma Oli, who is at the center of an intra-party turmoil in his country, has assured a trouble-free, smooth bilateral relationship, regardless of any domestic political situation. observers say this visit could mark the beginning of new era where the ties between the two sides will flourish like never before currently at a time when you know like nepal india relationship has soured in recent times so i think this very visit of indian foreign secretary will definitely prove you know to be a milestone in further strengthening nepal india ties 
New Delhi has been of instrumental support to Kathmandu lately. From developing gas connectivity to building railway lines to establishing integrated check posts, India has over the years been acting as a true ally to Nepal. Even during the pandemic, it has offered significant support to the Himalayan nation. From offering ambulances to medicines, New Delhi has strengthened Nepal's fight against COVID. Even during this visit, Secretary Shringla offered 2,000 vials of Remdesivir injections to Nepal for the treatment of COVID patients. Moving on, Australia has come down heavily on its defence personnel who were involved in killing of 39 innocents in Afghanistan. As many as 13 Special Forces soldiers are set to face dismissal following their culpability was proved in a four-year investigation. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has apologised and assured that a special investigator would be appointed to carry out prosecution in the case. President Ghani, however disappointed, said that he is reassured with words and actions of Morrison government and is waiting for justice. In a major development this week, Australian government has said that 13 of its troops who were involved in the killing of 39 innocents in Afghanistan will face sacking. The developments comes following international pressure that grew in the wake of a four-year investigative report alleging Special Forces troops of Australia carrying out war crimes during the Afghan period. Australia currently has around 1,500 troops stationed in Afghanistan as part of NATO's mission to eliminate the threat of terrorism but these war crimes were committed during the period of 2009 to 2013. Some say there was a growing warrior culture among the troops which took a heavy toll on civilians. At this time, 13 individuals have been issued administrative action notices in relation to the Afghanistan inquiry. At this point in time, no individuals have been separated from the Australian Defence Force. Administrative action includes receiving a notice proposing to terminate the individual service. The individual then has the opportunity to respond within a minimum of 14 days. Australia has forces in Afghanistan since 2002, following the overthrow of the Taliban as part of a US-led coalition. Initially, the international forces' role was to train Afghan troops, but they became increasingly involved in fighting insurgents. Australia in 2016 launched an inquiry into the conduct of its Special Forces personnel between 2005 and 2016 amid allegations by local media about the killing of unarmed men and children. The report blamed the murders of prisoners, farmers or civilians in 2009 to 2013 on an unchecked warrior culture among some soldiers. It said 25 Special Forces soldiers had taken part in unlawful killings directly or as accessories across 23 separate incidents. Junior soldiers were told to get their first kill by shooting prisoners in a practice known as blooding. Weapons and other items were planted near Afghan bodies to cover up crimes. Australian Prime Minister has assured that his government is committed to justice for innocence and was doing everything for justice. Um, we ensured that between that time on the receipt of the report and uh, the announcement of the findings of the report that we engaged a lot with our overseas partners. I in particular spoke to um, President Ghani 
and, and let him know about how seriously we're taking these matters and the processes we'd put in place under our justice system to ensure that they were dealt with properly. And he was very appreciative of both the, uh, the, the courtesy of that call but the actions that the government has taken to deal with this extremely seriously. So, look, there are always risks uh, out there and it's always important that Australia stays on the front foot to get, foot to get ahead of those risks. And I can assure you that uh, in our handling of this report that those types of issues were carefully considered and, and preparations as necessary were taken. President Ashraf Ghani, who has expressed his worry on different occasions, said that Morrison's words were reassuring and he looked forward to justice to being given to the victims. Apart from the criminal proceedings, Canberra will also be giving financial compensations to family members of the victims. While a fair investigative system of Australia has helped in delivering justice, there are many other accusations where not even an inquiry has taken off. While a section of population has shown its faith in the foreign troops over the years, a lot of other Afghans believe that peace will return only after the foreign forces withdraw. Moving on. Massive demonstrations have erupted in illegally occupied Gilgit Baltistan following the results of the assembly elections. Both the opposition and the common people have termed the elections rigged and said Islamabad used its power indiscriminately to influence the course of the election process and results. Protesters say they will intensify their demonstrations if the results were not cancelled and justice was not delivered to them. This mini truck set on fire by demonstrators is reflective of the anger and frustration amongst the people of the illegally occupied Gilgit Baltistan. Plumes of smoke belonging in different parts of the region is a clear measure of a political crisis the region has plunged into following assembly elections. <laughs> Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan's party, PTI, has won majority of the 23 assembly seats and is poised to form the government. Opposition has termed it rigged and blatant misuse of power. Hundreds of commoners too have joined in the demonstrations following a protest call made by their leaders. They say they will not move until justice is delivered to them. Even before the election date, the political class of Gilgit Baltistan had cast aspersions on the manner in which Imran Khan and his team was trying to influence and rig the election in the PTI's favour. But the electoral body, which boasts of being autonomous and fair to all, had turned a deaf ear to their complaints. ये ताकत के बल होते पर हमारे मिनिस्टर को चुराना चाहते हैं और हम इसको मौका नहीं देंगे और हम समझते हैं कि हमारे कायदे ने भी अंदर बैठे हैं वो निकलेंगे तो हम पूरे गिलगित बल्दिस्तान में इंतजार को बढ़ाएंगे While all elections in the illegally occupied regions are important to Islamabad this year's elections were of uncommon prominence and desperation for Pakistan Pakistan's all-weather friend China wants Pakistan to gain complete political control over the region for its strategic and ambitious China-Pakistan economic corridor. Under its growing pressure and demands only, Imran Khan in the run-up to the polls had declared the status of provisional province to Gilgit Baltistan. Moving on. The story of Afghanistan in nearly two decades has been both gloomy 
and encouraging. While on one side, the fragile security system of the country has not been able to protect thousands of lives country has lost since 2001, its determination, despite all roadblocks, to flush out terrorism is worth acknowledging. With the support of its international allies, Afghanistan has not just sustained the war, but has been gradually rebuilding the nation. Recently, foreign donors pledged $12 billion civilian aid to Afghanistan for next four years. Observers have hailed the decision, saying the country requires an unwavering international support to revive its economy. Foreign donors have pledged for a conditional $12 billion civil aid to Afghanistan amid positive hints emerging out of intra-Afghan peace talks in Doha. However, the message has been clear from the donors. The aid will cease to flow if Kabul fails in protecting human rights and doesn't make a progress in peace talks. The amount is expected to come in four installments of $3 billion per year for next four years. Despite coming at a time when Afghanistan's needs are growing due to rising violence and the coronavirus pandemic, the figure was a drop from $15.2 billion pledged in 2016 for four years. But I want to also say that this does not come freely. It comes with conditions. It comes with concerns. That the violence must be reduced. That a ceasefire must be achieved. That the peace talks must progress and must demonstrate progress in a timely manner, accepting that peace negotiations are complex and are time-consuming but progress must be shown. And also that the choices made in the peace talks may very well over time influence the ongoing commitment. Many donors also put strict conditions on future funding and some officially committed for just the next year. The United States pledged $600 million in civilian aid to Afghanistan next year, but made half of it conditional on progress in peace talks. The United States has contributed roughly $800 million a year in civilian aid in recent years. Another top donor, Germany, pledged around $511 million in 2021 and signaled it would keep contributing until 2024, but also stressed that progress towards ending almost 20 years of war was needed. Diplomats said keeping financing for Afghanistan on a tightest leash could provide foreign governments with some leverage to inject a greater sense of urgency into a halting peace process. Uh, these uh, pledges and support uh, rests on a set of uh, conditionalities. Uh, my colleagues spoke about those conditionalities, but let me get a little bit into details. There are two sets of conditionalities here, uh, and the government of Afghanistan would like to be quite uh, um, transparent about them, uh, because it's our intention uh, to meet those conditionalities. Uh, we owe it to our people, and we owe it to the international taxpayers and supporters of, of Afghanistan. Despite the ongoing peace process, the Taliban has continued its offensive against the government and civilians. Experts and observers say that a $12 billion aid to a country with expected GDP of just $18 billion this year is major assistance and its leadership requires to do a lot in order to bring better days for the country. 
the government of Afghanistan, which refrained from dealing with the Taliban for a long time, has time and again said that it has carved out a deal with the Taliban, but its nuances have not been shared till date, and nobody in the outside world knows as to what is the real status of the process. Rivers are considered sacred in India as they hold mentions in holy Vedas and Puranas. Among all the rivers that are worshipped in the country, River Ganga or the Ganges is considered to be the most pious of all. Every year, a number of festivals and rituals are organized on the banks of the Ganges to offer prayers to Goddess Ganga, who is believed to be the ultimate source of life in Hinduism. So this week in our cultural section we will take you to Varanasi city where devotees took holy dip in the Ganges to celebrate the most auspicious ritual Tulsi Viva. Let's have a look. Scores of devotees throng the carts of Varanasi to take holy dip in river Ganges as they mark the auspicious occasion of Tulsi Viva. On this day, devotees symbolically marry Tulsi plant with Shaligram, another divine form of Hindu god Sri Krishna. At the banks of the holy river, worshippers perform rituals and prayed for the well-being of their families. The day of Tulsi Viva signifies the end of monsoon and the beginning of wedding season in Hinduism. यहाँ पे लोग बहुत दूर-दूर से दर्शन करने आते हैं गंगा जी में स्नान करते हैं और आज एकादशी का दिन है तो आज के दिन क्या होता है कि तुलसी विवाह होता है और जो लोग होते हैं यहाँ पे नहाते हैं यहाँ पे दान पुण्य का कार्य करते हैं और अपने घर पे जाकर के तुलसी विवाह करते हैं। Tulsi Viva is the day that is observed on the Ekadashi or the 11th day of Shukla Paksh in the Hindu month of Kartik. It is also known as Dev Uthani Ekadashi. It is believed that on this day, Lord Vishnu along with other gods come out of their endless sleep to bless the newly wedded couples in the wedding season. On the evening of Ekadashi, devotees decorate the flower basil plant or tulsi with ocha. Then, by making a pavilion of reed around it, they cover the tulsi plant with a chunri and later the plant is wrapped and adorned in a sari. <laughs> बहुत काफी महत्व है पूरे एक महीना ये कार्तिक महीना चलता है ये आज एकादशी है तुलसी विवाह गंगा स्नान करते हैं दर्शन पूजा करते हैं आज बहुत महत्व है तुलसी इस बिलीव टू बी अ फिजिकल इनकार्नेशन ऑफ गॉडेस लक्ष्मी ऑन अर्थ एंड शी इस वर्शिप एवरीडे फॉर पीस एंड प्रोस्पेरिटी बाय हिंदूस It is festivals like these that form lay the foundation of the cultural diversity of India. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.